Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to GetCA 2022. Um, in this session, we are going to be talking about planning for feedback. Uh, before we start, we'd like to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Solto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these islands, no, nope, lands, for centuries. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. Thank you. All right, so this session is gonna be a little bit like podcast style. There's not gonna be a lot of visuals here. <clears throat> and the reason why uh, we decided to do it this way uh, is because we're hoping you can just put in some earbuds, walk around, go get some cleaning done, put your feet up. Just a listening session today. Um, so with that said, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jennifer espeo Harasimiak. I am one of the assessment and reporting consultants with Edmonton Catholic Schools. Um, my primary teaching background uh, is high school science and a tiny little bit of math in there. And uh, I've been in this role for three years now. And uh, my name is Erin Ochoa Whalen. I'm the secondary English consultant with Edmonton <laughs> Catholic Schools, um, which I've been doing for two years. I've been teaching for a total of 17 years, um, secondary English, um, and a little bit of junior high band, but we shall not speak of those years. <laughs> okay, so since we're talking about planning for feedback, let's let's just make sure we're all on the same page and we know where we are in the feedback conversation because, you know, you and I, Aaron, we've both been with Edmonton Catholic Schools for some time. Obviously, Edmonton Catholic has really shaped where I am and everyone has a different experience. So before I began in Edmonton in 2004, they they had started um, the, the AFL project, Assessment for Learning there was a whole committee and there were representatives from each school uh, that would go to uh, meetings, kind of like weddings, everyone gathers together. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then they would come back and they would in service the staff and mm -hmm. then we would try things out if we wanted to. It was all very, um, it was all very uh, voluntary. Uh, but, you know, that's when we really started talking about how feedback is, a major component of assessment for learning. Yeah, the assessment for learning, I mean, it relied heavily on the works of Ken O'Connor, who's still like alive and <laughs> kicking um, in servicing teachers all the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that around that time too is when I think we first started hearing of like the no zeros policies um, and then dealt with like the front lash and backlash that kind of came from that, right? And that's still, I think, a huge part of what informs our grading now, um, even though that's like, what, 15 years later? at least. So um, that's part of, I think, where that came from. The other thing I think that started around that time was the binary, if you want, or the false dichotomy of summative informative um, yes. assessment. And I think that's another, uh, you know, thing that we can't really talk about feedback without talking about that too. Um, and then maybe talking a little bit about what might have gone wrong or misunderstandings or mis- uh, handling maybe of that definitely with with the misunderstandings part I don't know why but somewhere along the way the AFL project the paradigm within teachers minds at least in in our division um and in, in secondary in particular went from you know its assessment that helps learning go forward um it went from that as the idea and morphed into a formative assessment is something that you give a test, but it doesn't count for marks. Something that doesn't count for marks. And the formative piece of that, the part that informs teaching and learning, um, became de-emphasized. And, and, you know, I don't know if that's so much a, a failing of, you know, not understanding it as it is a way for teachers to have managed all the work uh, that they had to do. You know, if you have 150 students, that formative assessment piece, it almost felt like, oh, well, if it doesn't count, um, then that's something that can motivate our students if they get a lower mark, hopefully by the time they get to, you know, the big summative piece at the end of the unit. Mm -hmm. um, 
then they'll they'll improve by then. And I, I'm not I'm not really sure we saw that without specific feedback to help students improve in the first place. I mean, I think looking back on it now, like you know, having 15 years, gosh, I'm old, of perspective on it, is to just kind of think about maybe we didn't um have the time or spend the time or had the language yet to kind of verbalize where we were at the time and kind of what I guess not what happened, but I mean, I just think about traditional ways of grading. And by that, I kind of mean like, you know, a, a teacher teaches to the end of the unit, gives a final kind of thing. Um, in humanities, as an English teacher, creates some kind of product that gets judged. But before we had Power Teacher Pro, before we had the internet, like if you want to go even further back, um, right, there weren't that many opportunities, uh, not even opportunities, there weren't that many times in a year where a, t a student would be told a number right, that represents like where they are in the course. And um, that's another part of it, I think. Like we, when we kind of had Power Teacher Pro come onto the scene, um, what that did was just kind of give students a 24 hour a day view into like the workings of our course. And um, because I think we hadn't yet turned the conversation from student product to the learning process, it was just we weren't ready yet for people to kind of be looking into our home <laughs> at that point. Yeah. And I think that that's something else that we're catching up now. But mm -hmm. it's still another, I guess, kind of like dichotomy that I always think about is that product versus process. If I'm actually teaching a student to help them improve upon something, then it's the process that I have to actually pay attention to. If I'm just kind of teaching my course in a way where I'm measuring where a kid is, and I've had this happen to me plenty of times student gets a 65 at the beginning of the course and they're around that same um, number at the end, right? If I'm a measuring stick, then that, I've done a good job. If I'm a teacher, I'm trying to help a kid improve, eh, right? What, uh, what haven't I done yet for that kid to help them climb up the hundred rung ladder, you know? Right. I think, I think that part about not being ready yet is, is very real. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but when I, I was in university in the late 90s, it was not taught to, no. to us as, as pre-service teachers, you know, the importance of feedback and practical ways of how to do that. Um, I know we talked about assessments a little bit, but in, in my class anyway, that we had one class and we focused on how to not write a multiple choice test and why multiple choice tests are bad. Uh, and then we tested using multiple choice tests but that's yeah. beside the point it, it's, it's just one of those things where you know especially as a high school math science teacher I mean I, I taught assessed gave feedback in the way I was taught and assessed and gave feedback because that was the system that was there that was that's what we had in place already and mm -hmm. you know it's funny I, I giggle because <clears throat> I started teaching in 2001 and uh you know, by then we we started to kind of bring in, you know, the psychology of learning and, you know, how how our, our students think and learn and how perceptions affect that learning. And and so I I remember asking my department head, can we get some green pens? <laughs> <laughs> because the red pens, you know, they make yeah. kids feel anxious and it's just this negative thing. So instead of marking and and you know, as, as a young teacher, it was very real for me to take in everybody's homework all the time mm -hmm. and mark it and spend hours marking. And, you know, instead of a red X check mark or circle, they were getting a green one and that <laughs> or a purple was one. feedback my students yeah. were getting as if, you know, that the, the color mattered, right? It's, it's like the intent was there, right? The intent to give something meaningful and to show students that this feedback, if you want to call it that, that this feedback is to help them and it's coming from a place of, you know, caring about yeah. the students, yeah. um, the intent was there, uh, but the impact really wasn't affected at all by the color of pen. I could have gotten a purple sparkle gel pen. Eventually over time, they would see the green or the purple sparkle gel as something negative and something to fear and not, look at it and internalize it at all especially because they gave a mark on it like they yeah. would look at it and they'd be like oh okay I got whatever they got if it was a student who <clears throat> did well they're not going to look at my feedback because they're like oh I like that mark 
and then they stop well, that's then that's the thing i think like we we're talking about um you know in university being taught to do feedback and i think that even if we weren't explicitly taught how to do it it was modeled for us all the time by our high school teachers by our post-secondary teachers again from a humanities perspective i give in a paper I, it comes back covered in ink um regardless of the color and mm -hmm. and <laughs> that ink is meant to help me go on and i think so many of us um still kind of do that right we do the same thing Oh, yeah. circling a wrong word, circling a spelling error, showing a kid that they're bad at commas. Um, but what you're saying, and I mean, the research, I think um, Dylan Williams is a huge proponent of this idea that there's research to support that if you give feedback and a number, the number speaks louder than the feedback and the feedback is going to go completely ignored, right? Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Like you said, if the kid's gonna get a satisfactory number, they put it away feeling good. If they get a number that is less than satisfactory, then they feel judged. Right. And they're no longer interested in what you have to help them because it's coming yeah. from a place of criticism. And um, I mean, that makes sense emotionally. And I think that in <laughs> terms of feedback and conversation and even education, maybe we're getting more into a, you know, an emotion, acknowledging the power of emotions and what we're doing and um, acknowledging the power of compassion. Right. And also acknowledging, acknowledging the power of impact over intent. Like, I do think that like switching from mm -hmm. from red ink to purple ink is um, it meant like we were trying, right? Yeah. Oh, but yeah. It, totally. But we, we just didn't. It was also pointless. <laughs> <laughs> it was aesthetic. Oh, I, I admit it fully. It was absolutely yeah. pointless. I mean, I know yeah. there was a point, but uh, ineffective. <laughs> it didn't it didn't do the thing that I wanted it to do. And, you know, now that I think of it a lot, I. For me, I never really actually did take in homework for marks, you know, in, in, in the whole ungrading movement and, and moving to assessment for learning and just trying to emphasize that a lot. That's one of the main tenets of, you know, making sure that homework remains as ungraded practice. Um, most of the time when I did give feedback, like a circle check mark X or mm -hmm. even a small comment here and there, um, it was often a summative piece where I would, I would put that information into my grade book. So way back in the day in Fort McMurray, I think, I can't remember what we had. We had some sort of spreadsheet. We put the information in the spreadsheet and there it mm -hmm. was. And it was, even though it was digital, like I didn't even need whiteout. It was digital. I was typing it into my little old iMac or whatever it was back then. And, and I could have changed it, mm -hmm. but it didn't even occur to anyone really that, you know, this is something we do again. And, and you know, we actually had a policy. No, you write the unit test, you're done. Moving on. There's no right. this test business wasn't a thing. Um, and I think now, you know, all of the feedback that I would have put on those lab reports or those exams or written portions of the exam, because we still have written in, in math and science diplomas back then, um, <clears throat> you know, give, giving that that feedback on a summative piece, even if I did get descriptive, it's kind of like an autopsy report. But that's, that's right. and that's, yeah, that's what we're getting to. It wasn't feedback at all. That's right. right. We yeah. all thought it was, and yeah. um, we were, you know, tried to receive it like it was, but it, it never was feedback. And it's because it was at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And it was maybe about the wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's again like looking back at the traditional kind of ways to say like, and this can be you know painful or harsh to take, especially mm -hmm. since I did that kind of feedback myself. But like yeah. I was not, it, I was underserved, right? As a student receiving that kind of thing, and I was underserving, right? Like I wasn't kind of doing what I tried to do. Um, and I think that maybe the, <laughs> the first if the first stage is acceptance, right? It's to think about all those <laughs> wasted hours yeah. of mine. Right. With my papers going through and marking them up and just to be like, it it didn't make a difference. But now that I know that, what can I start to do to make a difference? And I think that what we're talking about in terms of like the old grading that we used to do or even the format of only having that thing at the end is that was only one direction. Yeah. Right? And no feedback loop. can't. Yeah, there was no loop. And that's what we're going to talk about is just this existence that feedback has to exist in a loop between the teacher and student. Um, it can't just be a. I'm, I'm gifting you with this indication. I noticed that these two things are wrong. I noticed that you're choosing the wrong word or I noticed you're disorganized. But it feels like we're doing the student a favor because of the time it takes to mm -hmm. take in their work, you know, understand the problem and then like label it. 
and it our time is valuable like I'm not here to say a teacher's time doesn't matter like of course it yeah does. um but it's uh it it was wasted time it can it is wasted time so how can we set ourselves up so that the time that we are taking outside of the classroom with our students um is better spent and how do we better spend the time that we have with the students when they're in front of us to enact a feedback loop um as often as we can well i'm thinking that you know, <clears throat> since it is meant to be a loop, you know, we want to feed back to the students to feed, uh, this is gonna sound hokey, feed back to the students to feed their learning forward, right? Feed back to feed forward. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that means it's, it needs to be less of this discrete one-off event, right? Like yeah. having having a feedback loop is is more about okay we tried a thing we practiced something i observed you or i listened to you um i mean those are the fastest ways to to do it i mean if if we if i don't want to spend hours marking homework like i did when i was 21 <laughs> right um that sort of method of of doing things of waiting until i get something that the students hand to me and then i mark it as opposed to observing listening having conversations with students in class I mean that's where the feedback is the most important and I, I mean I think I think teachers know this and do it quite well but you know the whole emphasis of oh you have to have all of these things in the grade book to track learning sure okay we we can do that but we we also have to think about who is the feedback for right like having it in yeah. the grade to 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 track learning Okay, well, putting it in the grade book, that's more for our, our our stakeholders to just kind of get a little window, a little glimpse into that learning journey for, for our students. But if we're talking about feedback to feed learning forward, that is between the teacher and the students. Yeah. And right? when you or say stakeholders, the student student. when you say stakeholders, you mean like for administration, right, who might be telling us we need to have something in our yeah. power teacher pro comment bank It's for it's for parents. Right parents, to be yeah. able to keep track of what we're doing because they may not have access to our Google Classroom um, right. or you know the kids' paper or whatever, however you're doing it. Um, right. right, and it's I think that's a huge thing to make that distinction. Right, is like what is my feedback for uh, tracking <laughs> or performance for mm -hmm. like my job demands, and when is it for a student to actually improve whatever skill they're working on? And right. so it's not just about like the right timing of it um, yeah. or the right well and the right intention. But it's also about putting it in the right place and at the right time. And like the one thing I wanted to also mention is just like though um, Grant Wiggins is like a assessment scholar that I, you know, I quite appreciate the the work that he did. And he has this list of like helpful feedback is goal referenced, it's tangible, transparent, it's actionable, it's user friendly, timely, ongoing, consistent. I don't think this is news to teachers. Like I think we've been told for many years now, over and over again, especially the timely piece. But like, you know, when we're dealing with complicated products, that can be a challenge. The other thing, I'm kind of, kind of zoom to the side for a second. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. very tangential. Like about the, having a feedback loop in class is like, I think that especially in junior high, we are always having a feedback loop with students, but it's largely behavioral, right? The <laughs> thing I'm gonna say to a kid most often is stop. <laughs> sit down yes you can go to the bathroom take out your books I said take out your books where is your book okay yes you can go to your locker like it's all about what a kid is doing physically with their body you know um and I think that that's I think it's just important for us to acknowledge like not to slip in like yes you can go to your locker also your organization is bad. <laughs> like, just to kind of again like think about you know when I am interacting with my students and like you know what is my feedback what is the topic of my feedback and how can that be mm, directed more deliberately so if if most of the time you're talking to kids the things you say to kids is about behavior i mean that's because it's and it's obvious it's necessary in the moment that mm -hmm. okay we got to do this and then you know i have to talk to you you know thinking about my kids, you know, you have to talk to them about, you no, know, you have to stop clicking your pen because that is bugging everybody. And Making me insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it does mean that, you know, if we're making time for that, how could we, how could we take a look at the, the, the systems we have set up in our classroom, the routines and, yeah. and whatnot to, 
to make sure we incorporate time for it. I mean, this is the crux of the of the of the session. If we, yeah. we have to plan to give feedback, and if we want to, if we want to spend, you know, a lot of time at the end of our day or on our weekends providing written feedback to students on a product that they've given us, I mean, then we we plan for it, right? We say, yeah. okay you're doing four essays this this semester for social studies and i'm going to mark and give feedback on every single one um <clears throat> and and you know i think about i think about the time that takes if you're if you're teaching four to four and i mean let's face it the average size of of classes in a high school these days is mm -hmm. and the junior high well over yeah and the junior high for sure mm -hmm. is well over 32 33 i mean yeah. i think the last chem 30 class i taught had 42 kids in it so if i was marking every single lab report that they handed in to me and giving written feedback there i, I mean i wasn't seeing my family mm -hmm. right so I mean, you you either plan for it to make it happen, or it will plan it will plan for you, right? So, how could we give change that discussion in the classroom and put the emphasis on? Okay, well, we're going to be talking about these things today, and this is where our students get all of that time that they want to um, that they want to talk direct their students yeah. and their well, conversations. We, we, they can get feedback from us, feedback from each other. Yeah, we, we talked about like the traditional forms of feedback and how they mm -hmm. don't serve us. And I think traditional um, classroom routines also in some way don't serve us. And I just think now, like back to my high school experience of an English class, there was a lot of listening involved, right? A lot of sitting and listening and being quiet because like our class was capable of doing that. I mm -hmm. think that that might be not a reasonable demand these days for a whole number of reasons, like the pandemic, maybe not even being chief among them, but like the socialization, right, is also a huge kind of thing. So if I don't have to, if I don't want to spend minutes of my class only telling a kid to sit down or stop talking, what can I change in my classroom so that it's not a problem if they're talking? And that would be to have actually student-led discussion, right, to, to create an environment where a kid can safely speak to, the students can speak to each other, and I'm not the one in charge of asking the questions, you know, recording the answers, directing the conversation. I think that that's a huge part. And I, I think this is like regardless of subject area um, to get students actually kind of involved. And then I can just be listening myself, right? And tracking yeah. if I need to, but which kids need to work on their questioning skills, which kids need to dial back the domination of the conversation a little bit, um, right. which, you know, which I noticed the most, right? The student that's like, oh, I got this. And it's like, wow, stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know um yeah. and uh that's not wasted time to have a kid work on how to speak children work on how to speak to one another um especially since a lot of them have been on computers for a, a year and a half right over teams or zoom or whatever you know that re that reminds me of what uh one of uh your former colleagues who's a math teacher said to me last time i i talked to him you know he was musing you know, we really have to look at the outcome. He said, if it says, ex explain something, right? No matter what what your uh, your subject area is, um, if I'm the person in the classroom standing at the front doing all of the explaining, I, I haven't done my job because those outcomes are not for uh, me as the teacher, right? So it's, it's for the students. So you, you actually, it's more efficient if you stop and get the students to do that explaining. And I mean, it's fastest if it's verbal, mm -hmm. right? It's fastest if it's in a discussion. And then, as you said, I can walk around the classroom and listen and give feedback in the moment. Oh, I'm not sure if you got that one right there. Can you say that one more time? I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that and reason through it um, right there and then, and that helps to drive that learning forward. I think about too, you know, how am I going to plan for it? You know, I was in a job share situation where my partner, her name's Kay, she she taught me something wonderful, you know, and it's so logical. Why didn't I think of it before? But how did I always teach before? I would spend the first 45, 50 minutes of class teaching, right? They would write some notes, I would do a demo, uh, we would do a few practice questions and then the last 20 minutes of class, 
they were doing practice questions and they were working. Um, and, and, you know, Kay said to me, well, what if we broke this up so that they aren't sitting still and just listening to us talk for this long? <laughs> and mm -hmm. I thought, That's a good idea. And at first it was hard to take that last 20 minutes of class and break it up into four or five minute chunks and intersperse those five minute chunks throughout my 50 minute lesson. It was hard because do you know what I liked to do there during those 20 minutes at the mm -hmm. end of the class? Uh, that's when I would take my attendance. Sometimes yeah. I would check my email. I would target a kid about, hey, you know what? You didn't hand this in on time or something along those lines. And I, for those 20 minutes, I wasn't focused on their learning so much as managerial stuff. Um, but, you know, when I started trying it Kay's way and we planned it out together, I was tired at first, but you get used to it. You get used to it. And then eventually I realized, you know what, that email can wait. I actually get to talk to every single student in my class pretty much because I'm walking around and I'm checking their learning and I am giving them feedback while they're learning it. And you know what's you know what's being taken apart like in the conversation like what you're talking about is like also the act of teaching as mm -hmm. process and not performance, mm -hmm. right? And that's another thing and I'm just like harping on the old masters now, but whatever. But like, you know, the product of the lesson plan, the product of the mini lesson, the product of whatever, mm -hmm. um, it does kind of, force us to like organize our class uh courses or classes into these again unproductive or inefficient kind of divisions right and um maybe there's just no need if we know it's not working why am i going to give a lecture if i know that eight out of 30 kids are listening <laughs> the other 22 is that bad if i'm lucky yeah, well, that's it. Yeah. And it's the same yeah. eight over and over again. Like we're, I think we're all very familiar with that as teachers. And um, it's, it's just funny. Like, I think that's what you're talking about, right? It's just breaking this down. We're in the moment. I can give the kids what they need when they ask for it. The kids that aren't asking, now we have to spend time getting them that ability to ask for what they need. Right. And again, like we haven't yet even spoken of like specific examples of feedback, but that is part of that loop, right? Is getting a student comfortable enough to come to me and ask a question that's that's big and I think um the other part too is giving them the language to ask question which is a huge thing like I you know that whole there's no stupid questions thing I think exists as an idea to just make people comfortable and expressing what they need but there are stupid questions yeah, that, that, <laughs> that so you can't tell kids that you know, that like, there are no stupid questions <laughs> even a staff meeting right someone asks a question <laughs> we've all been there I know that I'm there are stupid honest, questions because I'm full I'm of the them. Person and everyone is looking and they're like, what are you saying? There are stupid questions. Absolutely. And it's just, so then it's just, but then we're talking about like relationships, right? And like mm -hmm. having a student in, in a position where they can feel safe asking that stupid question, but then eventually bring them to a place where I'm helping them make a difference in the subject area that I'm teaching, right? And to divide that subject area down into further skills. When the last time I had a grade book a couple of years ago, I had discussion as one of my skills that students were developing. They got a summative score eventually, right? And I could say to them, it's just like, well, you know, you're asking questions, you're directing the conversation, but you're kind of overpowering and you never ask anyone else a question. You just go, un not unlike myself, right? So like we need to change our ways. And then to the other student who's not speaking at all, right? How can we get you involved mean? in this discussion? There are no stupid things to say. Put your hand up and say, I agree. You're still moving the conversation forward, right? Those kinds of little things. And I think that um, since I'm uh, creating, and I have a scoring guide that we'll put in the files here, but since I'm kind of creating a place where a kid has an opportunity to improve, that yes, I'm tracking that in my grade book in, in Power mm -hmm. Teacher Pro um, to show them that they are developing a skill, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to you know, how how you were listening and you're observing and you're talking to the students in your class, you know, when, I don't know, whatever you would be talking about, whatever text you would have been looking at or film that you're observing. I know my son just did, uh, they just watched the movie Science and they were looking for motifs and themes. And Classic. All that. And, and, and then on. He was so excited. He came home, mm -hmm. he, he said, let's, let's let uh, the little sister just watch her own movie on an iPad and uh, the rest of the older people in the house, we will watch this movie together. And he kept pausing it. 
And he kept saying, he's like, did you notice? Did you notice? The circles and the roads? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too bad about Mel Gibson, but anyway. <laughs> right. But, but like, I can tell that these are discussions that he's having in his class. And, mm-hmm. you know, I can tell, and even he's told me that, you know, oh, my teacher, he said that, you know, I got to think of it this way. So I'm watching it again because I want to think of it this way. And it's, it's because of those 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 conversations and what what you're listening to in your class that it might at first blush sound a little trite to oh you get to watch a movie in class lucky you you know um but then when you think of it as you know this is a this is a a tool that we're we're using and it's obviously a guided viewing it's not just teacher sits back puts his feet up and drinks his coffee right it's 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 one of those things where he is walking around and noticing and this becomes part of that loop where he's asking the students questions he's getting them to sit in their groups and talk to each other and he's giving them feedback as he's hearing it those types of things he's using in his scoring guide as well Mm -hmm. you know just Mm -hmm. just just as you said and i think even in um in science that that walking around and observing and listening i mean when can that happen in science we often think of it oh it's just right or wrong in science because you know you have an equation or you did an experiment and off you go um but i mean there are skills to build in in science as well where if my students are carrying out a lab i mean the basic lab skills don't change from lab to lab are you being safe are you following those instructions are you communicating with your team all of those things are part of the program of studies and those are things i can track in my grade book mm-hmm. and those are things that i can provide feedback on in the moment so the scoring guide that we use in ela right it's created by the government and it, it's, it exists at six nine and twelve when they have the standardized tests and what's nice about using those i think consistently in all the grades is that um, there is like a thorough line from 6 to 12, right, in terms of how the scoring guide is organized. I think that those categories can be broken down and like shared with across subjects, right? Mm-hmm. So like to have, to give a convention score and to to let the social teacher or the science or math teacher, when you collect written work, if you were looking for conventions, this already exists. I think that consistency helps students, right, to know mm-hmm. and to see that they're the scoring the same. The convention score should be the same across the board, right? But um, the thing is, too, we can use those scoring categories for products other than essays. I think we can use them for almost anything. If a student is kind of is creating an annotation assignment, for example, like um, at any point in the year, I can use my supporting evidence categories to to give back and let the kid know that where that's where they are. Or even just like a brief thing, like a paragraph or, you know, a reflection or even when they're speaking to say, like, (laughs) I wouldn't say you're not speaking with style. I might think it. I don't know if I'd say it. (laughs) But um, so that by the time the kid is creating such a complicated product that I'm using more than one scoring category at a time, they're not surprised by what they get. Right. Mm -hmm. To say, like, your ideas have been great so far. Why is it with your first written assignment? Your ideas are garbage. I mean, there there is where you're creating an opportunity once you have those observations to give feedback that makes a difference. Right. To say to a student. I read this, you are so concerned with, like, the words that you're using that you're not actually putting together a coherent argument. So like, how can we, like, what are you trying to say? And then that would affect their thought and understanding thing. But it's like, um, when, when then can I use those scoring guides individually or even to break them down even further? Because inside those scoring categories, there's usually three to four bullets, right? So for example, in organization or form and structure, arrangement of ideas is separate from development of ideas. And those are very complicated and different things, even though they're all into one scoring category. To say to a student, these or these uh, your arguments here aren't necessarily in the most effective order, right? Or to ask them also why are these in this order? What would happen if we move them around? That's a matter of arrangement. Development is different. To so say you make an excellent point here and you even have support, but then you move on to a different point. There's no discussion of what you're trying to put together, right? And that again can be um, useful feedback, but it would be feedback in for that student in that moment only. Right. I'm not going to say that to every single kid. Mm-hmm. And I used to do this. I used to go through our scoring categories and break it down piece by piece. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do this. You got to do that. But I mean, if our feedback isn't digestible in bite sized pieces, I'm not going to hear it. I can't. I need to have one thing to work on at a time. Right. Given like 
this and this is true no matter what the situation like in my family in my job as a teacher um, as a student give me one thing to work on and when it's then then i can move on to the next thing right but don't tell me i have 85 things to do because guess what i'm going to shut down do none of them plagiarize skip never make eye contact with you again <laughs> and you know what will be yeah. will be and really just check out during class right like i i think about going back to that that chunked interspersed lesson where you know five minutes of, of of practice where i could walk around and give feedback um not only was i tired but so were the kids mm -hmm. you know they were tired because they weren't used to that type of always having your brain on it was doing something different every 10 to 15 minutes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but your their brain was all, always on and yes eventually they 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 got used to it but one of the things that um did did help with like that kind of in the moment stuff was actually teaching them how to look for certain things like look for what were the success criteria of this just like you were talking about with your scoring guide like what would have made this successful and mm -hmm. I think with um my classes in particular we we didn't often get to talking about the questions that asked the students explain this describe this compare this um because it was it was tricky I didn't know how to give the feedback i didn't have the language necessarily right. to to encourage um students to think more deeply about it um it took a little while for me a, as a teacher to grow as a teacher to to be able to do that so i think it's also important to note like we're all starting at a, at, at our own place right now this is not mm -hmm. a race to a finish line type of thing um but but i think about i think about also leveraging leveraging the conversations I have with my colleagues as well helps me grow, right? Like, yeah, well, and I like not just like kind of bouncing ideas off colleagues, but thinking about like the kind of conflict or tension that exists in ourselves. Like yes. I love talking about assessment because I really like teaching, but I hate marking. And that's something that I had to, like I couldn't ever ignore, right? Like why do I hate marking so much? Even though I love teaching, I want to help kids get better at writing, and I know how to do that. And I think that it's because I did understand and still do that so much of my marking practice was completely ineffective, right? Because it was that one thing thing. I wasn't doing a loop. I wasn't setting up my classroom in a way where I could tell a kid in a moment, right? Um, you know, I, I read your piece here, and like we can talk now about why you start every sentence with the word I, or we can have a conference later and talk about it, but it's got to stop. It's got to change. But to have that conversation before I ever get to a summative moment, because mm -hmm. if I if I don't do that, they're never going to hear me. Right. They'll just mm -hmm. stop, they'll shut down altogether. Um, that's not easy. But if I'm really trying to help a student improve, it's what I got to do. We were talking to about the things that are like easy to pick on. Right. In humanities, that conventions guide, that commas, wrong word spelling, it's it is an error. It is a mistake, but it's not that big of a problem. And it's I mean. You know, if I'm looking numerically at our scoring guide, right, evidence and supporting um, supporting evidence and thoughts are always going to be more important than if a kid does the spelling correctly. And I, I mean, we are also kind of living in a time where you, you can't go two seconds on the Internet without the computer telling you that, to fix your spelling. Right. If there's already all those mechanisms there to give a kid that feedback, then that's something off my plate. Now I can do the important things instead of those surface things, even if those surface things feel more objective in the moment. Yeah. Well, and we and we have to. Yes, actually, that part about feeling more objective. I think. I think, you know, sometimes my kids will come home and be like, oh, how school? My teacher hates me or something like that. Why would you get this? <laughs> What's going on? My teacher hates me. I'm like, no, no, they do, they don't hate you. Well, they're just picking on me. You know, it, not that it happens often, but you know, it's like, well, look at what, what did they write? What did they say? You know, this isn't about you, the human being. This is about the work you produce. This is about, you know, what did your writing look like? Or what did your lab report look like? That is the part that, that they're, they're getting at. Well, it's not right or wrong. It's all subjective, mom, you know, and, and, it's it's easy it's easy for us to say oh okay well yeah my my students get some feedback they know what they got right and they got wrong mm -hmm. but that's that's feedback and then it stops that's not a loop right it's, it's not feedback, feedback. 
Yeah, feedback is they know what they got wrong and they know the next step to take to make it better the next time. Exactly. So feedback yeah. to feed forward. And 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 you know, it's it's easy, it's easy to think about feedback and assessment and all of that stuff as, you know, this is a discrete event. Whereas, you know, the methods you're talking about, instead of waiting for them to hand it in and say you don't have to start every sentence with the word I, mm-hmm. right? Um you know, and I'm doing it in the moment, like this is something that it, it can be ongoing. It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be this special thing that you do that you stop instruction. When, when it comes to feedback, if feedback is really to improve learning, it has to be part of the instruction. Um, yeah. I think sometimes, sometimes when I, when I visit schools or classrooms or talk to um, administrators or teachers, they, they say, uh, okay, but you're the assessment consultant. Yes, I am. And they say, then why are you talking about instruction? I want to talk about assessment. I want to talk about feedback. And it's, <laughs> it's, well, we need we need yeah. to use our assessment information, whether it's informal conversation in the moment right now, to drive our instruction and to direct learning and where I'm going next. We, we have to do that. And it needs to be an ongoing thing. I remember... As a young teacher, after teaching my first diploma course, and the next year we got our results back, and I was like, oh, okay, so I'm going to engage in some formative assessment now. I didn't teach this well. I need to do this mm-hmm. better, whatever. And it was, I totally took those results as feedback for me that I could use formatively for me. But then I also tried to kind of pass it off as formative for my students too, because, oh, now it's directing my teaching. But it's really about the kid in front of you right now. I know we keep saying it. We keep coming back to the the students in front of you right here in this moment. But yeah, I, I really think that feedback is also, you know, you talked about being actionable before. It has to be actionable with the students in front of you. It has to be part of your instructional routines. And you have to give kids the opportunity to interact with and do something with the feedback. Yeah. Right? So check circle and question mark or X or what have you, if, if I never gave my students the opportunity to do something with it and show me that they can learn from it, again, what's the point? Well, and Why they have am I to do it, down all of yeah, this they, stuff? They have to do it right away. That's the mm-hmm. other part that's such a challenge, right? If I'm only going to use an essay that I collect, you know, four times in a semester, three times in a semester, mm-hmm. there's like, you know, four weeks maybe in between each opportunity that's, I don't remember what I was doing a month ago. It's like mm-hmm. November, like, right. Like I, it's too far away. Those things are too far apart for there to be like a meaningful kind of improvement. And I think that, you know, I'm familiar again with the argument. Well, it's on the, the kid to kind of take that in and like go back to their essay and work on it and improve. And it's like, it is also on the teacher to create a, a, an opportunity for that in the classroom. Right. If it is truly important, then it should be part of our routine. And I think that um, that is, too hard it would be too much for me to orchestrate I'd rather just in the moment at a time look over a kid's shoulder and be like "Mm -mm, stop (laughs) stop it yeah right or we talked about this or Mm -hmm. depending on what my relationship was with the kid Mm -hmm. at the time the other Mm -hmm. thing is this um if we are dealing with classes of 30 kids um around that number I'm Mm -hmm. not going to get to every kid for every assignment and that's just true like (laughs) So, like, instead of kind of spending, you know, 10 minutes an essay, every time I collect 300 minutes is five hours. Instead of spending five hours an essay, putting stuff on their paper that, again, research and experience has told me they will not hear, Mm -hmm. then how will I kind of piece out that those 300 minutes elsewhere where I spend, okay, this week, I've got these 10 kids. I'm going to say something to them today, this week about their organization, right? Uh, maybe I'm going to be sending voice notes home over email or attaching them into PowerSchool or links, whatever kind of system you're working with, where I can send something verbal. Maybe it's written feedback. Although I do think that between those things, in-person spoken, vocal, or written, I think written is the least effective because I'm missing the opportunity to have a student hear my tone and hear that I'm not mad at them, that they're not organized. Yes. I'm just trying to help them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that's the thing too that I just wanted to talk about. Like any kind of chance for feedback it feel it can feel like criticism, but it's I think also an acknowledgement of like the potential that a student has, right? And it's important for me to say that to a kid. Be like, I'm telling you this because I think you can get better at it. 
I'm mm-hmm. not just telling you this because I noticed that your spelling's bad. Kids mm-hmm. know when their spelling is bad, mm-hmm. right? Like if they could fix it for you, they would. So why don't we just, again, move to something that's a bit more meaningful and build something up. And if, yeah, I don't know, if their spelling's really bad, like I said, they're allowed to use autocorrect, right? Like yeah. <laughs> in Microsoft Word. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, um, when, when you said voice notes, it reminded me of, um, of, of an English teacher. He, he let me come in and observe his classroom and see what he does um, for students to act on feedback. Uh, his name's Brent. And it was, it was really wonderful to see that he, w- he actually used with his English 30s, he used those voice notes on their essays that they had submitted via Google Classroom. So he didn't mm-hmm. write anything down. And, you know, he he worked time into his his plans. He had a whole class, well, maybe half a class, where he said, all right, you know what? Everybody go your earbuds, go grab a Chromebook or use your own device. Sit down, open this up. You're going to listen to the feedback I gave you on this portion of the essay you had it in whenever. And then here is here's a thing to help you reflect on what I've said and make a plan of how you're going to make it better next time. And you're gonna rewrite the one paragraph Mm. that I gave you feedback on. Yeah. And so it was really interesting to to see the students do this and they're sitting and they're listening and they're like, yeah, you're totally right. Or I disagree, (laughs) you know, and they're just all talking to themselves because everybody has earbuds in. But to see, their work uh, afterwards, making a plan, this is what I need to improve on according to this. So my new paragraph is, and then, you know, they just typed that in and then they submitted that. So they didn't have to redo the whole portion, the whole uh, assignment, just that yeah. one part, because A, he was focusing on something um, very, very specific. And B, he gave them the opportunity to use that feedback for learning to show that, okay, I've got it. I, well, that's I just, it that's it. I, I think that that's like, if the one thing I can kind of say to a teacher and going forward, this will be the one thing I say is like, this is a feedback loop. So your next step is how am I letting that loop continue? What am mm-hmm. I giving to a kid? And that, what can they give back to me? It always has to be like around and around. So that, that paragraph, that rewrite is such an important part. And yes, that does mean it takes time, but again, like it's for the kids who do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All the kids are going to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. and it's yeah. also yeah, and it's it's for the kids to kind of focus in on kind of that that one thing. And then when you're doing that, you're also building a relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're saying to a kid, maybe your vocal feedback is we talked about this before, but you didn't do it yet. So go back to the notes you took when we talked about it before and try mm-hmm. that. That's that took 15 seconds maybe for me to say, right? I'm not now spending again 10 minutes on an essay. I can just give a kid that one step. Now they have something to do and they come back. Okay. What's the next little step instead of, like you said, this kind of 10 minute event that I have to section out for every single piece of writing. We have to kind of, I think, move move away from that. Yeah. And I, and I know, you know, I I was telling some other teachers about this. I was like, Oh, you know what this guy Brent did. Um, And, you know, talking to them about it. And this happens all the time, not just with, you know, this strategy that Brent had used, but lots of different strategies. Um, Sometimes I get, and sometimes I think, I, I don't have time for that, right? Yeah, <laughs> you course. know, I think about, I think about, you know, how heavy our courses are. I mean, Science 10 is probably the heaviest course I've ever taught in terms of just Content. your volume of yeah. learner outcomes there are for students. Oh, that's um, what I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, like there are so many learner outcomes, 197 or something like that. I had to count because I had to put them into power school. Anyway, <laughs> um, that's a different story. Um, anyway, <laughs> just looking at all, all of those things, and I think I don't have time for that. You know, you know, when, when I go back to the classroom, it's going to be one of those things where I'm going to call a little bit. I'm going mm-hmm. to look more closely at, okay, where do kids in science 10 typically struggle? That's where I need to spend more time. And it's not, it's not the weather unit, what we used to call it uh, in the olden days before the new curriculum that's now 15 years old, 16 years old. Um, It's, it's not that, that's not what I'm going to call because I still have to teach the concepts there. Um, But maybe there are things that I can spend less time doing, you know, Uh, I do love to tell the stories. I do love, 
anecdotes and uh, maybe I can take less time using those anecdotes in class. Maybe uh, I really look closely at, huh, I'm asking my students to pretend to be one scientist writing a letter to another scientist explaining why their model of the atom was slightly wrong according to my experiment. I mean, yes, it's important that my students understand that, but that's one outcome yeah. in the program of studies. Why yeah. am I spending so much time on that? Could I not, you know, talk about it, get the kids to talk about it in class so that they show me the understanding and then we can move on instead of, you know, them spending all of this time trying to pretend to be somebody from the 19th century. You know, the the length thing is, I mean, one of the most popular questions a student asks a, an English mm -hmm. teacher is how many paragraphs does it have to be? How mm -hmm. long does it have to be? Um, P.S. The answer is not five. But I think that <laughs> what a, a, a teacher does have to kind of think to give an answer that serves both the kid and my own time, because I love to watch TV, is how long does a student have to make this before I can accurately, reasonably assess the outcome that I'm looking mm -hmm. for, right? I don't need five paragraphs or 1800, no, nope, yeah, 1800 words to give a student feedback on their voice. I don't need that. If I'm just gonna be looking for voice this time, I, I need like a paragraph, that's it. I can figure it out. And maybe it's different for every kid. That's the other thing, right? For you, Jen, I need 10 sentences from you, Brent. I'll just use that name because you said it. I, I, I don't want sentences at all, actually. <laughs> for you, I want you to send me a voice note so I can just listen to what you're doing since that's what we're working on, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. I think, a flexibility that the English scoring guide does give us and the English program studies does give us that flexibility. And even though that flexibility, like I said, may not have been modeled for me by um, my teachers of your, uh, it's still worth the risk to see if it'll work. Because like I said, I have other things I'd like to do with my time besides sit and enact the same inefficient processes over and over and over again. Yeah, it's 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 about kind of taking a step back and looking at the long game so that you can plan to give feedback for learning and plan to enact that loop what routines are going to allow you to do that? So using your voice notes, um, chunking your time instead of having, you know, 50 minutes teaching, 20 minutes practice, um, and looking at um, really examining what is it that we're asking our students to do? And is that is that going to be a high yielding um, strategy for activity? Or, yeah. Or even reasonable, because here's the other thing too, and this might be controversial, but like I want, I want to talk to people about this stuff because I love it. If I have a student in my class, or more likely two or three or four, who I know are not ready to write an essay at the same time as their other the other students, mm -hmm. then why am I assigning one? Mm -hmm. Right? Why am I setting that kid up to fail? Why am right. I setting myself up to tell them something they already know and that I already know? That doesn't right. make a lot of sense, right? Yeah. So if I do have those kids that aren't ready, and even moving away from I mean, there are deadlines we are not allowed, not allowed to move away from. But if I don't have my gradebook set up to only be recording products, yes. right? If I have it set up so that I'm looking at skills, then there are other ways for me to assess the student's skills other than assigning them something I know that they cannot yet. And I, I mean, that's just, that's been true of my classroom student makeup since day one, right? And it will probably always be true, so. To have such diverse learners, yes. and diverse Yeah in the classroom yeah I, it's it's a performance of sameness that i think we have mm -hmm. to kind of just move away from yeah we might be you know the the outcomes are standardized right what the students are supposed to learn that's standardized we have the program of studies um mm -hmm. at the end of it all the diploma exam that's standardized that's that's the measuring stick we're we're using but how we get them there right and how much focus we use. That's that's the part where, you know, we can really be responsive, just like in that loop. We can be responsive mm -hmm. to the to the human beings in front of us um, and really, you know, attend to to their their true deep learning and and their own growth and improvement. Just get those relationships in there. Mm -hmm. um, because of how we're planning it on purpose um, and how we're being intentional about 
I need to manage my time. I need to manage my workload. I need to make sure that these kids learn. Those are that's what I'm focusing on. Yeah. Um, and we don't have to remain. This is going to be traumatic slaves to tradition, right? We don't have to be. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I was just when is it when is it working and when is it not? Right. When am I ready to try something else? And I think, again, that's different for every teacher as well. But uh, but if you've made it this far, listener, then it's probably important to you. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Hope so. Mm-hmm. Hope so. It's, this is one of those things where, you know, there are no concrete answers because, you know, the the skill, the emphases, the uh, where we are in in our um, professional growth and 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 practice it's it's as diverse as our students um so well, and, and yeah yeah the experience hoping, too right exactly. like i'm so much better at helping a student right now than i was the first time i ever taught english 30. it's embarrassing and i've apologized to past students and being like what i'm sorry i was young <laughs> but like that's the but case true. yeah yeah so sorry young people <laughs> Yeah, me too. I'm sure it's yeah. have some people out there listening. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I, I just I just think that you know, for us to come out and say, oh, here's the answer, Mm-mm. not gonna work. No, no <laughs> so and, I mean, that's the other thing too, right? Like I'm speaking from experience, but I'm not speaking from perfection. Like I'm the furthest thing from it. But like I said, I at least can admit when I've wasted my time, and then be like, okay, that's a waste of time. Let's mm-hmm. let's all stop. Let's all stop doing that, right? I'm not going to tell a kid that they're using the wrong word anymore. Because even though it bothers me, it's still the word they chose. And I would have chose a different one, but I didn't write that essay they did, right? So instead, we'll just talk about effect. You right. use that word, and it made me think of this. Is that what you planned? No. Okay, well, then, now what? That's the feedback I just gave you. You made me think of this, and you didn't plan on that. What's the next step, do you think? Right? And like that, again, as the feedback loop continues, eventually a kid figures out for themselves, Oh, you told me this three times before, so I, I did this instead. Perfect. Yeah. You've learned something. Yeah, and and I think too, you know, while you're having that conversation with students, it's not like they're all waiting and listening for you to have that conversation, right? You've planned to have them engaged in some other work while you have those tiny little conferences. Yeah, um, with your students, and 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 you know, some some of us are there and some of us are not. So before I started that job share situation, I was not there. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Not even a little bit. Uh, I was doing something else. And, you know, after that job share situation, I mean, it's okay. I I, I fully admit that being in that um, partnership, that was teacher peer coaching at its best because Mm -hmm. we were helping each other out. And, um, you know, we we capitalized on each other's strengths and weaknesses because we were in different places in terms of experience, philosophy. And you had a feedback loop of your own, right? Going between you and the teacher. And that's that's the other thing, I think. That's what, what we're trying to say, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it really is about relationships, like with our students and, and with one another. Yeah. Yep. So uh, we're coming up to the end of our hour here. So before, uh, before we sign off, we just want to uh, let you know that we have uh, a list of resources on our slides here. And we will have a document that is hyperlinked to uh, some of the things that we've talked about. Um, and if you are wondering who you should follow, which authors you should read, um, you can uh, start off with this list right here. So I know Cult of Pedagogy is one of my favorite podcasts. I'm very much a listener and not a reader. I love mm-hmm. the audiobooks and podcasts. Um, and she is uh, she is a, a, a humanities teacher, uh, but as a science teacher, I've used some of her stuff in my classroom too. It is it is transferable. Um, and and Aaron had mentioned before Ken O'Connor, Dylan William, uh, and Grant Wiggins, but there's a couple other there. If you are an English teacher that Aaron uh, pointed out, like Penny Kittle and Kelly Gallagher, um, mm-hmm. they are excellent resources um, for uh, humanities teachers as well. I'm going to add Alexa Wiggins too. She has some great oh, stuff on please. using discussion in the classroom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and another one is Susan Brookhart. She is wonderful. And if you are an administrator listening in, Susan Brookhart's book, um, Advancing Formative Assessment in Every Classroom for Leaders, uh, that one is a fantastic one if you are uh, 
an administrator and you want to uh, support your teachers moving forward uh, with feedback and planning for feedback. But that wraps it up for today. So thank you so much for, uh, I guess, plotting with me. Yeah, work. no, always a pleasure to talk. I guess we'll have our emails in here too if people want to send us emails. Uh, for sure. Continue the conversation. Um, oh, yes, because it's a loop. Yeah. We got to yeah. do it. <laughs> that's right. Oh, gosh. No. <laughs> 10 <laughs> minutes per listener per, yeah, cool. Okay. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.